Welcome to our Bible class on the epistle of Paul to Timothy. We're in First Timothy. We're in the fourth chapter. And last week we spoke about the, at the end of the class, we spoke about the hope that Paul had. And so we know and what our hope is. Our hope is laid up in heaven. So we, we, we call it the hope of salvation. We're going to heaven and we can have the confidence or the assurance of that. And we see this in leading up to our, our study to, today. Verse 8 says, Bodily exercise is proper for a little, but godliness is proper for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So we, are, we have a promise of the best of this life from the spiritual perspective and the one to come. And that's what exercise will never uh, help you other than the fact lack of it will get you there quicker, I guess. And, but but it's, it's not going to help you. There is the godliness, it's the piety toward God where you reverence him and God, I know for certain your promise is there. You promised, and therefore, I know this is a doctrine. So what did it lead to his service? He labored and strived. And you got two words there. If you were to say two distinct things about his service, what would labor mean that's different from strive? Or how would they relate together? Because there's a conjunction and there. There's the work that you do in labor, but is it strenuous? Is it hard? Is it difficult? Sometimes painful? You strive. It's not work. It's strive. And of course, we, we think about, what am I going to do with my career? I think uh, I'll choose this profession because uh, it's never labor. I just love it. It just, you know, you, you'll pick that. But it is labor. But what happens when you start doing the details of that labor, there's a striving. Well, his hope in heaven allow Paul to not only work hard, but to go through the painful aspect of his service. And you just read his epistles, you know as I do, what pain and suffering and persecution he went to, that he could say about his hope in heaven, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge will give me. So there's, there is that service, and what do we know about God? He's a living God, he's active, he's not an idol. He's not power. He's not money. He's, he's not those things that we hold to as being uh, the, uh, the security for ourselves. He is. I am. He's always in existence. He doesn't need anyone else. And he is a living God who's able to act and bring about the fruition of this hope that's in heaven. And what is he? He's also the savior of all men. Isn't it interesting that he says God is the savior of all men when we think Jesus Christ is the savior of all men? Both of those statements are true. But God had made this plan for salvation before the worlds were formed. Jesus executed it. The Holy Spirit revealed it. The Godhead, were all, they were all united in bringing about this salvation. So God is our savior as well because of his, his great plan. And because of, of who he is, he's living, active, he's, he makes a promise, he fulfills it, then we are secure in our, our hope. We will go through the difficult labor of serving God because we know that we have a hope reserved for us in, in heaven. And we've, we started the, the uh, with Timothy, we, we'll look, we, we've looked at that particular aspect of that hope. Peter will talk about it as well. So that's where we ended last week. Didn't get, get to go into a lot of detail about each aspect of it. Any questions on about your hope? Is, is, is hope just something you wish for? And we say, well, I hope I make a good grade this next test. Well, the way you talk, do you expect it? No, I just hope. <laughs> well, you wish it. Is that what it is about our hope in heaven that's so secure? What's that? It's anticipated. it's anticipated. That's right, because it's there. I don't want to miss it. It's reserved in heaven for me. It's guarded through faith. It's reserved in heaven for me, because, and it's guarded through faith in God. Uh, there's our faith. We expect it. We exercise our faith. 
It is expectation, firm expectation, not just a wish. And we use the word hope a lot of times as wish. I hope he behaves today. You got any expectation of that? Probably not. I just hope. And we go from there. But that's not about our, our hope in heaven, is it? So we come down today. This is good for young people. Good for your daughters, granddaughters, great-grandsons, great-granddaughters. It's never going to change. And he says in verse 11, these things command and teach. There's the, there's the parts that we've just looked at. But then he says, let no man despise thy youth. Do you get the idea that Timothy is young? From the perspective of the Holy Spirit, in the culture in which he lived, uh, he was still young. And what does the word despise uh, mean? I use the American Standard has that. You might have other newer translations that do it, but, but it's, what, I, what I can gather from the word is, is to kind of look down upon, despise. Uh, does anyone like to be looked down upon? No. Uh, we don't like that. And here are young people. Yeah, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. I'll cancel you. I don't like to listen to you. That's kind of what we're doing. I, mean, I don't mean it personally, but it's, that's kind of what, what it is. You, you don't even, not even worth it for me to even consider. So we'll just get you out of our universe and our, our thinking. And that, that's, that happens. But dismissive is a very good thing. Who likes to be dismissed when we want to be present? We want to be engaged in things. So that's, that's the concept there, but it's young people. So let's put it in the standpoint, how, how can young people be dismissed? So you're, I guess you're older, and you know, I'll just, I'll just, I despise them, I look down upon them, I, I dismiss them, dismissive toward them. Uh, why would you ever do that? Yeah, they're this young, no experience. Wait till you get my age, you know. And that's spirits talking. And usually they get there and then maybe 20 years, well, you're dead and gone. And they remember that. So uh, you have a legacy. But you, uh, you're popping up daisies. You don't know that maybe. There, that, but that's true. You're inexperienced and there for there. So let's take a short, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And, and that's the, that's the sol solution. That's a guard against that. That's, that's true. But it's, instead of character change, which we're doing, we're showing you change your character, that's God's way. What do, what will inexperienced youth, how will they try to overcome being despised? If it's not the character route, what is it going to be? That's right, and there's the character. So I'm going to be a good example. No, I'm going to burn down your office. You don't, don't you despise me. I'm going to burn down your store. Don't you, don't you dismiss me like you do because I'm just young. Uh, we will get in your face. I'm woman, hear me roar. Whoa, where's the meek and quiet spirit that is a, God, that is a great price before God? And so we force, you will, you will honor me because I'll cut your throat if you don't. I'll be in a game. And you will reverence. We're not dismissive. We're, we're a, we will do you harm. And the fear comes in. And you're supposed to not be despised. You'll be despised even worse. So God's way is interesting. You've already, you've already hit on that. He, he deals with character change. And the character change when we become a Christian, but then the character that the Christian ought to be living is how, how we ought to be living is there. So you be, a, my version always gives, it's not example. 
It's in sample. It's the word tupos, which means it's a little bit stronger example. It's not something coming out of something. It's something printed. Uh, it's, it's struck. And so you got there. I'm in your face. Whoa, no, I'm, I'm here to do you good. I'm here. Uh, my character is going to be godly, which uh, you will profit from, by the way, uh, if I'm a young person. So they, you're to be, you have that example for, for them. Uh, and that belief and you and you have it in all aspects of your life in word and how inclusive is manner of life what do you ex what do you exclude from that I exclude my words in this context but everything else is game everything else is there how does a young person react to crisis that they've never had experience before how do they how do deal with that how, how do they deal with failure? Blame somebody else? Yeah, that's the way a lot of people do. Or reflect upon that and uh, kind of be silent about it and learn something about it uh, instead of getting your face and how come, how come you, you did that? And, and some of it is we, we have righteous indignation when we're young and we think everybody ought to I'll treat people right. Well, I'll, I'll be treated right. And when the Bus driver turns my car halfway up in a parking lot. I, I, I'm indignant. <laughs> he, he's, he's dismissed me. He's trying to teach me a lesson to go in the wrong way in a parking lot at five o'clock in the afternoon. Nobody's there. But he, he did a number on me. And I remember going to the principal and I was irate. Fire him. You know, that's what he's supposed to do. Well, we don't fire the, we don't, we don't even give a ticket on the, on the uh, parking lot. As if I don't remember this, it's an issue with me. I still do. Kathy's in the car with me. She, she remembers it. But uh, there, I know as I wouldn't do that today as uh, irate as I was. I didn't behave myself unseemly. Uh, Mr. James was very nice to me, the principal, and he understood that, but uh, he, we just eased the, the heat. I got a lot of heat when we were young. You have tempers and stuff like that. Well, that's, uh, that's the way we re react to things. But that was a manner of life that could be sinful. I don't think it was sinful. Uh, he just grinned at me. And he knew. <laughs> he taught me a lesson, I guess. But, uh, but the, it could issue into that. I could be cursing. I, I could be reacting in a way that wasn't righteous indignation, which Mr. James saw in me. And he tried to uh, settle me down. But that's when you're young. And I, I still think I was right. And uh, I knew I was wrong the way. But there was nobody in the parking lot. So, so here we go from there. And, but that's what happens with youth. And if we're not careful, the manner of life will, we want how, how do they react to a crisis? Uh, what's their, it's distinct from speech because they're your word. It's distinct from your teaching. That's your word. It's how you live. Peter talked about that knowing that these things are all to be dissolved, what manner of person are we to be in righteous living, in holy living? What manner of persons? It, it means uh, what country you're from. And you know, we see part of our, in the United States, can you tell when somebody's from Alabama or Tennessee instead of New York? You listen to them, they're just, oh, that guy's from Tennessee. You're from Texas. Texas has its own uh, accent. So we see what part of the country you're from. And people see our, our character of living in crisis, in good times, being cheerful because God allows you to be cheerful even when you're sorrowing. He allows you to be cheerful through the difficult times because uh, this is just a journey and you're going to try to make the best you can and, and, and helping and glorifying God in the things that you do. So there's, it's a very inc inclusive thing. And a lot of times young people have a hot temper and they, and they grow out of it before 40, usually. They're supposed to. Y'all be grown up there. And uh, that, that's what we're hoping will happen. And I'm wishing, I hope it'll happen when I say I'm wishing. So it's a manner of life. But look at the manner of life. Here's the category. In love, that means I place a value on everybody in this world because they're in this world. 
that are made in the image of God. And the love here is placing value. I can place a value on a person who's my enemy. I can place a value on someone that's done me harm. Uh, and I will show love toward them, not get even with them. In love, in faith, in purity. There's your manner of life categories. And in faith and then the purity that I'm holy, living before God, those are things that are, are there. And if you teach, your, just think of it, when you, you, you have children, you've got young people, you've raised them, they're, they're fine young people. When you see them interact now in the world uh, and you've brought them along, what, you know, you get feedback sometime. He's a little different. She's a little different than what we're all used to in this world. Uh, I don't hear foul mouth I don't, uh, out of them. I don't, I don't hear them try, trying to get even or lying or bickering about other students or other children around them. Uh, they're, they love people. They, they're living pure lives. They're not, uh, not using their bodies in an unlawful way. There's so many things and it doesn't take much to be different from the world today. I understand that. Uh, but there's always a difference in the world of young people that are not striving to guard against being despised because a lot of times they're not despised. They are admired. And why are they admired? Because of this character, these characteristics. So when you, 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 you teach your children these things, uh, it sets them up and people may never come to you and compliment you, but they see it and they respect it. You respect character. And what a wonderful thing to get into our uh, minds of our children. Any, any comments you'd like to add to that? That's the hard road. Change your character and you'll eliminate despising from people. Now they may persecute you now because you just, you just hit their, their conscience and you made them look bad and they're going to go after you. Uh, so what? How do you handle that? We, got a, we know manner of life about suffering persecution. And, and when we get that, we raise them early or children early and they can be that way as adults. You got a fine human being on your hands and a, a fine uh, man and woman. Any, any comments on, on this? Yes, Eric? Yeah. And, and as a congregation, I can commend church here. Uh, you're always encouraging the young people, aren't you? You're not dismissing them. Well, and it, it may, you make it easier when the young people are showing the character they are. So it works both ways. But sometimes they, they need just encouragement over something that you've seen that, that stands out. And maybe other people might not ever think about. And uh, that's... Uh, but those are, that's a good point. He, they prove themselves. And that just keeps on gaining respect in the eyes of the beholder. They're watching that. All right. So we got, got that down. How, what three areas of Timmy's ministry connected, uh, was connected with Scripture? Let's just see if we can uh, find that th here in verse 13. Till I come, give heed to reading, to exhortation. To teaching. Mm. You find three things there? Is that an easy answer? I think that's it. So let's, just, let's delve into it. What three areas of Timothy's mirrors connected with scriptures? What were you to read? Well, you need to read the classics, man. You've you got a lot of Grecian authors around there. You get busy and you read that. What do you think they're reading? I think Paul wanted Paul, uh, Timothy to read. 
If he'd read him, he'd tell you what. We know Timothy's parents, a mother and grandmother, they grounded him in the what? Scriptures. And that's the Old Testament scriptures that we're looking at with, with Timothy. New Testament was being written by Paul. <laughs> He's writing one right here to Timothy in the letters he has. But the idea of listening to the letters of Paul as now that Old Testament that's grounded him is being fulfilled. You keep reading the, the, these, uh, these epistles. You keep reading the scriptures. These are written for your learning as now they are able to see in their own uh, up-to-date experience that hasn't been written down yet. Uh, that's confirming uh, what they're going to have written down by Paul and the other authors. Uh, you keep, you read. And, and a lot of this reading would be public reading of, of the Old Testament scriptures and then show, well, this is how it's being fulfilled in, in Christ, or reading these letters. It's always amazed me that, you know, they were like, the, this is written to an individual, but the book of Ephesians and the, uh, to the churches, they were, they were read to the audience. So you had slaves and children and husbands and wives, and they're listening to Ephesians 5, Ephesians 6, and getting the exhortation and admonition and warning and teaching. Uh, Timothy would be reading to the church those, those letters that being circ circulated by Paul. So that's the type of reading you do. Well, you need some outside reading. And what are you going to read this summer? I read some mystery. Of, you know, I'm doing a lot of reading. Paul said, give yourself to reading. Well, what kind of reading in his ministry? And that's the idea of getting the text. What does that tell you about the nature of Christianity? What I just said is true of reading scripture. Reading. You know, you read words. They come to your mind. Uh, you see the context of what is being said, the cognitive side of you. It's not the emotional side of you that's reached. It's the cognitive side. I, I read it. I absorb it. I learn it. It's part of it changed my character. Whew, and it hurts. It hurts. I don't like that. I, I, that's not me. And I'll, I have to strive tomorrow. Labor and strive uh, to, to even be a, be a Christian. But there's the, there's the thought that we're looking at of, of reading. And then what follows that? When you see the reading of Scripture and application through epistles that Timothy is being read, circulated by Paul, uh, exhortation. So what's the difference between exhortation and teaching? Because it says now teaching. What's the difference between exhortation? What is teaching? That's different. It's, it's the order of teaching. <laughs> so we don't, we, we don't uh, accentuate doctrine here. What's doctrine? It's teaching. We just love Jesus. Well, that's doctrine. It's teaching. We're not to go beyond the doctrine of Christ, the teaching that Christ has given. And I emphasize that because I've uh, engaged with some, with a preacher in a congregation, you think a congregation has learned this, uh, but they, there's, there's new people coming all the time. They don't know what doctrine is. And they are, they're coming in with, uh, what do you mean doctrinal stuff? I want a relationship. And they fail to realize that the relationship is built upon the doctrine. And I hope we'll never get there because this is a congregation I thought was well grounded and all of a sudden people are questioning this, questioning that. There's people, younger people growing up and they're being influenced. That's why you have to come back to it. And when you have, this for example, and this is the example that's given to me. You, you go through the book of Romans do you see a transition from Romans 12 through 16 that's different from Romans 1 through 11? Do you see a transition? Let's put it that way. Uh, humor me, please. Go, go to Romans 12. 
of verse 1. What does it say? We're going to do some reading. What does it say? I beseech you, and what's the next word? Brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. That kind of fits with what we're talking about. What has, what does a therefore make you do? Cognitive reasoning. Therefore, does something have to come before for you to say a therefore that's important? Yeah. Try to think of it when it doesn't. That here is this, Mr. Fine, do you know the speed limit is 30 miles an hour? And you know, it, the parking lot, it says this way, it's one way. And therefore, <laughs> you just got hit because you're going the wrong way. Therefore, what's the base? It's based upon a fact. It's based upon teaching. It's based upon what's been established. It's based upon doctrine. And when he says the mercies of God, therefore, the mercies of God, the first 11 chapters is telling you how you're saved by the grace of God and his mercy. That's doctrine. And it's being applied now to your life. Now, because of what God's done for you in these first 11 chapters, therefore, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And if Present your body's living sacrifice. Oh, that sounds good. I'll just have a relationship. What's it based upon? By the mercies of God, I bought with the price, glorified God in my body. You go through all the New Testament, you'll find doctrine, doctrine, doctrine that's telling you why you need to present your body a living sacrifice. God owns you. Jesus owns you. And the first 11 chapters of Romans are there. You go to Colossians, the second chapter. This is the one I have dealt with because people say we're not issue oriented we're a good church we're not issue oriented like some churches are what's an issue well verse 16 of Colossians let man no man therefore judge you in meat and drink respect of a feast day new moon or sabbath day you read Romans 14 and you don't tell me that meats were not an issue are they an issue <laughs> New Testament time? Meats. And where do you get an issue is when you apply Scripture. They were applying the Old Testament dietary laws. New Testament, there's, all meats are clean. So you got an issue. Do you avoid it? Or is Paul issue oriented because he brought this up? Let no man therefore judge you. Watch the doctrine. Verse 14, he's blotted out the bond written in oranges that was against you, was contrary to you, taken out of the way, nailed into the cross, having to spoil the principalities. Let no man therefore judge you in what the Old Testament said. What comes before creates a therefore. And I go back and look at it, and you'll always find doctrine that's going to change how you live. And you're not going to have much of a relationship with God if you ignore doctrine. So issues can be something that's not founded on scriptures. I just don't like him. I, and I want to listen to what he has to say. Dismiss him. You don't have an issue. And you'll, but there's a teaching in God's word how to deal with somebody like that. And, but when you're applying scripture... You're going to have to stand up and apply the scripture in the face of the false doctrine. Paul says in Romans 16, 17, about people that we avoid. We avoid these, oh, that, that's not kind. That's not, that doesn't sound like a relationship with, with God and with the Lord. Yeah, but that's, that's what the doctrine teaches us. I beseech you, brother, mark them that are causing divisions contrary to the stumbling, contrary to the doctrine which ye learned. Cognitive work. Read it. Bring it into my I, I don't theorize about it. I know it. And here it is. Deal with it. Here's what. Now, how come you're contradicting that? What, what information do you have that goes, uh, that says, well, I didn't get the whole picture. No, you get the whole picture 
and then you, you live on it. And you'll never regret living on that. But you, there, this is their force. And I'm not going to deal, I'm not going to have company with them that cause stumbling because they're teaching the false doctrine. And uh, it's something that we all can learn. Oh, learn. I'd rather have a relationship. I feel. And that's the world we live in. So I don't want this church, because you've, been, you've heard it preached. But that doesn't make any difference today. You hear it preached, and then you just, I, you'll go somewhere, go somewhere else in your, in your mind. Doctrine is teaching. Everything about love is doctrine. And we're not going to be uh, a sound church if we don't have sound doctrine. And learn the teaching and let that have the appropriate emotional effect upon you. It'll be joy. It'll be gratitude. It'll be hating evil. All of those are emotions that come not because I start with the emotion. It's that I cherish the doctrine. I perceive that all of God's ordinances are true. I hate every false way. Yeah, that's doctrine. That's godly reaction. I hate it. Well, you're walking in the false. That person's walking in the, you call it false way. I hate the false way. And so don't be scared of doctrine. But see, that's usually a smoke screen. We're, they're issue oriented. They all talk about doctrine. Well, what do you talk about in living the Christian life that's not doctrine? I'm waiting. Everything you want about emotion and feeling and love and forbearance and mercy is doctrine. So let's don't let the smoke screen get us where we're not going to deal with applying scripture. Let's always apply that scripture. So teaching is here the doctrine and then exhortation is because you know what the doctrine is. Go that way, brother and sister. I know that's the right way to, right way to go with God. You, we're not going to have We've marked this person, and we've got a factious person, second, third, you know, first and second admonition. Uh, but here they are. This is the life they're living. And we're going to let, we don't, that's not the character of the Christian. We want everybody to know that. And be willing to stand up for what doctrine is. But when people are there, and they're on the verge of which way shall we go? Exhort them. Exhortation is not refutation or it's not uh, turning them away from something it's exhorting them all right let's go let's go get up they started walking now, come on walk some more and you're exhorting them in the way they should go so so here is the the life of, of timothy there was the reading because the cognitive action of words meaning context here's the i can teach it now Paul had confidence in Timothy to present all his ways in Christ. Why? Timothy is going to tell others about what you teach, Paul? How could that happen? Because truth is truth, and Paul had confidence that Timothy is going to present it like he does. We can all believe the same thing. We all strive to believe the same thing. And when he does that, he teaches it and exhorts people to go. Now, we've, all, we, we've seen, Paul said, there's other things for the chapter, this book has ended. There's other things you do than just exhort. You reprove, you rebuke, you exhort. But here, exhortation, being a good minister of those things, and that's what his ministry ought to be connected with. Now, question 13. How did prophecy and their presbytery, presbytery relate to Timothy's spiritual gift? There's, there's a lot of things going on in that question. Let's see if we can uh, see it unfold before us. Verse 14, neglect not the gift that is in thee. I'm saying that's a spiritual gift that was in him. Do you see whatever that gift is in him, was it overpowering him? Got the spirit in me. Miraculous, I got a miraculous gift. And I've got to use it. Well, 1 Corinthians 14, they had miraculous gifts. And he said, don't use it right now. Be quiet. And let others speak. 
before you speak. So that, that was how they exercised in their assembly these miraculous gifts. But here we're looking at something else here. If you can neglect it, it's something that's not overpowering your will. Is it? If I can't help but deal with that, uh, then you might have a, a power overpowering me that, that regardless of where I am and what I'm feeling and all that, I, I can't neglect it because you, the spiritual gift is powerful. We've got to do it. You can neglect a spiritual gift because he said, don't do it. If it's impossible for him to do that, so here's a miraculous spiritual gift and the exercise thereof, especially with Timothy, I think I'll be a little, I won't preach today. When I, God has given me inspiration to do that with miraculous gift. But he says, neglect not. So there's your spiritual gift, which was given thee by what? Prophecy. How was that gift given by prophecy? What's that? No, that's how, that's how it was given, but that was given by the presbytery. That was done by the presbytery. Something else was done by prophecy. And that's where I get, I get the presbytery. What is presbytery? Let's just get that. Who is that? Presbyterian. Where do you think they got it? This, the Greek word. What is it? It's not a denomination. What is it? What? Oh. You connect it with elderly people? That's right, it's elders. Who are, we've, we've, we've studied this, and we've, elders, we saw in 1 Timothy 3, elders oversee denomination? No. Elders oversee the universal church? No. Elders oversee a local church. And they have to be of age, and Timothy's young. He's not the presbytery. But it was a laying on the hands of the presbytery what was prophesied about Timothy. There's the prophecy. That's the giving of the gift. It was prophesied, Timothy, you're going, I'm, I'm setting you forth the prophecy. This is a spokesman of God. You're going to be a minister. And then who sent him on his mission? The elders. How did they do that? The laying on of hands. It was a symbol of sending them for. It wasn't imparting the, the spiritual gifts because we're going to find out before this chapter is over. Paul gave him the spiritual gifts. But it was sending by the elders on his mission. Uh, let's see an example of that so you don't think it's far fetched. In Acts the 13th chapter, when first sending of, of uh, Saul and Barnabas and their work and the ministry, it said, as they ministered to the Lord in verse 2, and fasted, meaning, God, your way is more important than food, and we're concentrating on this mission, he says, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I've called them. And he says, then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. The elders of that church in Antioch were led by, by them. Uh, there were prophets and teachers setting forth the fact that here these gonna, people are going to be on that ministry. So there, there, is, the, there is that uh, gift being exercised uh, through prophecy of the mission that they're going to be on and laying on the hands is just setting them forth to do that They did lay hands on people Paul the apostles did and uh, imparting spiritual gifts But Paul was not a married man. How could he be the presbytery and before we know it We're going to see that he'll say in the end that 
his gift, the gift that, Paul, that Timothy had was by the laying on the hand. So when you get all the things together, you see these, these divisions. So prophecy is leading, this is the one I want to go on that mission, just like we saw in Acts 13. And the gift is a spiritual gift. I want to say it's miraculous because of, of the guidance that Timothy needed. But the laying on of hands was setting them forward, setting them forward to um, that particular work. Any, any comments on that? And here he's, he's stressing it was from the elders that laid on hands. That's why I'm saying they didn't impart the gift to him. They sent him on the way, but that's how it related uh, prophecy and the presbytery. Elders sending him on the way, prophecy speaking of, of what his mission would be led to his spiritual gift laid on by the hands of Paul. And I think that, that we'll, we'll cover that. Any, any thoughts or do we have miraculous spiritual gifts today? Do we? No. Maybe we need some more doctrine. <laughs> no. And, and the reason why? Because we just don't like holy rollers? It was in part, and we got, that's why we can have confidence in it. We've got now all of the writings fulfilled. It's once and for all delivered. And when those things, became, when that was perfect, has come, meaning a complete revelation, that which is in part was done away. We have the inspired teaching. We just don't need to look down on doctrine. And then we'll, I think we'll be fine. Our, our time is up. We'll, uh, Lord willing, next week we'll, we'll pick up with question number 14. How is he going to progress in his spiritual ministry? Thank you.